Cats appear in lots of folklore and are revered by many cultures around the world, with their seemingly mysterious ways capturing the imaginations of people for thousands of years. And during that time, they have established themselves as a very important animal in human culture. And one could argue, since agricultural farming, a more important pet than the dog. From Viking Scandinavia to ancient Egypt and into modern day Japan, cats have a fascinating history in folklore, but are not so well known in mythology. So why is that? Well, in this video we will explore this phenomenon and the rise of the cat in mythology and some of the myths and tales surrounding these creatures. So grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Crackenford. To start our journey into cat mythology, we must first understand how cats appeared in our culture and became domesticated, especially considering that humans had spent the majority of the time in the last 100,000 years avoiding them, especially the Eurasian cave lion, an animal that would have no qualms eating an unarmed human, and one of our natural predators when we were hunter-gatherers. But something significant happened to change things, and the story of that starts around 15,000 years ago and this would forever change how we viewed our relationship with cats. So what happened 15,000 years ago? Well, we started to see settlements for hunter-gatherers forming communities and starting to farm and domesticate wheat and barley amongst other grasses, and this was all happening in the Near East. And as hundreds and thousands of years passed, we farmed more and more of our grain so that by 10,000 years ago, we were producing enough to have excess, and this needed to be stored somewhere. But a quick note on farming. We didn't just stop hunter-gathering and farmed 100% of our food. We see through genetic archaeology that we first farmed a very small percentage of our grain, and over time this went up from 10% of our food to 20% to 30% and so on. Farming didn't happen overnight. It took several thousand years to become significant to our food supply. And so, as we farmed, we needed to store this grain. These stores attracted animals who wanted to eat it, such as mice and rats, and this in turn would have brought with it disease and depleted stores of food. But nature often finds a way to balance things. So, this concentration of mice and rats drew one of their natural predators, and that was the cat. And specifically, the North African and Southwest Asian wildcat, Felis sylvestris libica. Now, as another aside, some people believe that this is also the reason why pottery came to be, as storing grain in baskets would seem to be a bad decision, if protecting it against vermin, as these containers could easily be chewed through. But academia seems to favour the view that pottery came to be as a product to allow the cooking of marine and freshwater animals and using it as storage for grain was a secondary importance and was adopted after that. And I'll link to the papers about this and other points in this video in the description below, which is where you'll find the like button, which costs nothing to press and really helps this channel. So thank you very much for all those who do press it. It does mean a lot. And so back to these communities where 10,000 years ago, our farming ancestors saw cats catching rats and mice around their stores. And whilst cats weren't fully domesticated at this point, this was the start of the process of humans and cats being tolerant of each other within the same environment. And as tolerance turned into a form of trust, and this in turn introduced selective breeding, and so the cat had begun its journey into human culture. And there is some evidence of this journey beginning with a burial in Cyprus, where a Felis sylvestris was buried with a person. And whilst the cat showed no evidence of being domesticated, there is almost no doubt that the cat and the human had a bond. Now, these cats look just like the domestic cats we have today, maybe a little more muscular and a little less docile, but generally similar. And even our domestic cats of today could be considered almost as wild their ancestors in many of their behaviours. And so, in effect, the relationship was of convenience. Humans provided a good source of food and protection for the cat, and a cat in return catches pests and vermin. So let me tell you a story about the origin of animals. And 
cats. And this is from the Kabila people of North Africa. And this has some motifs similar with our early creation myths, which I've made a video about. Now, the first buffalo and heifer emerged from the depths of the dark underworld, their eyes seeing light for the first time. The buffalo followed behind the heifer, and after seven days, he noticed that the stream of urine from the heifer flowed backwards, and like his own. Due to this strange difference, the buffalo decided to examine the heifer and explored her, and this led to other things that animals often do. And the heifer gave birth to a calf, which grew up and eventually had a calf of their own. As the buffalo's son grew older, he became interested in mating with his mother, but his old father buffalo drove him away. The buffalo son sought out people, and when they asked him who he was, he told them his story and explained what a cow was. The people listened intently, explaining to the buffalo that benefits of living wild compared to being a pet. The buffalo thought about this carefully and decided to return to where his parents lived and drove his father away, leaving him with his mother and sister. His father ended up in the mountains where wild buffaloes were revered by people living in the caves and they drew petroglyphs of the buffalo and made sacrifices to the buffalo. The buffalo father was however without a wife. In desperation he sought comfort with the stones of the mountain and five months later under the influence of the sun a variety of wild animals were born emerging from the cave including seven pairs of gazelles, six pairs of zebra, five pairs of rhino, and many other animals. The buffalo father took care of the animals, teaching them to eat grasses and roots and showing them how to copulate. They multiplied and flourished, but an ogre man was eventually born, and from him a lion came, and from the lion came the cat. And so after cats start to become domesticated in the Near East, we see it appear in Egypt, a region that often had much influence over a portion of the Near East, especially the Eastern Mediterranean coastline. And so it should be no surprise that they too eventually adopted the cat into their culture. In fact, we can thank them for the name of the animal we now call a cat, which derived from the Egyptian name Quata. And so the Greek Gata, and that's an aside, the term pussycat came from the Egyptian name of an Egyptian god associated with cats called Pesht. But more about him in a minute. So if we wind the clock forward several thousand years to around 3000 BCE or 5000 years ago, we find domesticated cats in Egypt not only protecting grain stocks from vermin, but they were now appreciated for catching snakes. And this looks to have increased the Egyptians' fondness of the cat. And we should also consider that they already had cats in their culture before Felis Silvestris Libica was introduced to them, with lions, leopards and cheetahs, still very much respected predators in the wilderness of Egypt and beyond. And we even see rock paintings that are over 8,000 years old in the Eastern Sahara of all these cats. And the people who painted these would eventually migrate into the Egyptian culture as the Sahara dried up and the Nile became the only real significant source of water. And I'll talk about this more in a future video and what these paintings mean. But to Egyptians, all types of cat were respected. In fact, most animal life was respected by Egyptians. But the result of this cattiness within their culture is that by 5,000 years ago, a goddess in Egyptian religion called Mafdet had been established. And she was a lion woman, although often shown as being just a lion in early imagery, or occasionally a humanoid with a lion's head, with some depictions showing her with the skin of a cheetah or leopard uh, on her body. And we first see descriptions about Mafdet in the pyramid texts, a collection of ancient funerary texts from the old kingdom of Egypt, which refers to Mafdet as the killer of snakes, implying that the domestic cat's abilities were known at the time these texts were written, which was between 2613 to 2181 BCE. Now, 
Mefdet at this time was known for protecting the dead and has been linked to the mythology of Osiris, whose body parts were separated into pieces and sent all over Egypt by his brother Set. But we do see an earlier reference to Mefdet on seals of Den from Abydos, and Den refers to King Den, the first king of the first dynasty of Egypt. And these seals show Mefdet, and this means that we know that from around 2940 BCE, which was when King Den died, Mafdet was responsible for being the protector of his personal chambers and so linked with the dead, implying he was now linked at this time with protecting someone's home, their domicile, if you will. And all this gives us evidence that 5,000 years ago, cats were firmly established in Egyptian culture and mythology. Now, we also see Mafdet continued to be worshipped in Egypt to around 1000 BCE, so about 3000 years ago. But we also see a change a few hundred years after the death of King Den, when a new goddess appears in Egyptian mythology, Bastet. And she appeared between 2890 to 2670 BCE. And so during the second dynasty of Egypt. And we know this as she too is also mentioned in the pyramid texts. Now, Bastet was represented as a cat or a humanoid with a lion's head at this time. So there's some overlap in here, perhaps even taking over some of Mafdet's roles with both having connections to the sun uh, with protection uh, and particularly of women and their secrets. Uh, and by that, we're really talking about fertility and childbirth as well as justice. And we see Bastet's role expand eventually becoming the goddess of cats, of music uh, and joy, and her appearance starts to look more like a domestic cat rather than a lion, which allows her to be distinguished more easily from the appearance of Mafdet. Now, the role of Bastet eventually aligned her to the protection of home and from evil spirits, and this rise of Bastet as a goddess led to there being a cult of Bastet, and this was based in the Egyptian city of Bubistis, and thus it allowed Egyptians to travel there with their dead cats, and there the cats would be mummified, and buried, so that they would be close to the cat goddess. However, what we also need to be aware of is that this worshipping of cats didn't necessarily mean Egyptians placed them above all other animals, we see in the writings of Herodotus that the Egyptians revered many animals from crocodiles to hippopotami, from mongoose to hawks, all of which went through similar processes at death. Although he does specifically talk about how Egyptians do go out of their way to save cats from fires, often considering the cats' lives more than the value of the property they're protecting. And this reverence of cats by the Egyptians persisted until the end of the Ptolemaic dynasty in 30 BCE. But like many traditional religions, we see different regions of a culture worship similar gods, but with different names. And so we see similar gods to Bastet, and one of these is Pasht, who was revered around the region of Thebes. And so many hundreds of miles south of Bubistis, and this god was sometimes depicted with a cat's head um, and was also associated with fertility, but also prosperity and good fortune. And he was worshipped around the New Kingdom period, so from between uh, 1550 BCE to 1070 BCE. And so all this represents the cat's rise from a domestic pet to its first appearance in mythology, and specifically Egyptian mythology. And so how and when did cats appear in other mythologies? And the answer to this lies with trade ships on the Nile, where mice and rats also found themselves hidden in the trade goods, which included grain. And so many boats had cats on them as they sailed up and down the Nile. And as trade spread and boats sailed to other kingdoms, the domesticated cat became introduced all up and down the Nile before spreading to India and then Asia. And so as Egyptians traded with India, cats came along and we believe they were starting to be domesticated probably around 
4,000 years ago here. Although this is an educated guess, as the first literary sources of evidence don't appear to about 1500 BCE. Now we see big cats within Hindu mythology. Um, they appear as vahanas, uh, which are like mounts for the gods. So we have the goddess Shakti with lions or tigers as a vahana. We see Shiva with the big cats as vahanas. And these big cats can be seen as representing nobility and strength. And these cats aren't just mounts, as when reverence is paid to the god or goddess, something called the puja, it is also applied to the vahana. And we also see in the fourth avatar of Lord Vishnu, Nala Simha, who is half man, half lion, and who is still worshipped in some places in India today. And we also have in Hinduism, the cat-headed god Durga, although again, her head is often a big cat, but she can also be regarded as a guardian of the home and protector of women. But in terms of domestic cats, then we have to go to Bengal, where there is a local deity named Shashti Mata, and this goddess is the protector of pregnant women and young children, and her Fahana is the domestic cat. And this connection of protection aligns to the Egyptian mythology, although I cannot currently find any evidence to prove the mythology travelled from Egypt, but there's also nothing to suggest that it didn't. And we also see, much like in Egypt, that the cats are kept in homes to keep them free of vermin, and so are seen as protectors of the home and treated with respect. However, the folklore between Egypt and India has within it a strange story that looks at cats in a different way. So let me tell you a story traced from Malula. In Syria. After a long journey, an oil seller arrived at a village in search of food. However, as soon as the food was served, it was devoured by mice. The villagers explained that the village was overrun with mice and begged for the oil seller's help. He promised to return with a solution. A couple of days later, the oil seller returned with a cat, and he was paid 2,000 piastres for his services. The cat successfully rid the village of mice, but then began catching birds and pigeons as well. The villagers became concerned that the cat would eventually turn to eating them and decided to take drastic measures. The elder of the village ordered everyone to abandon their homes and move into the fields. And before leaving, the villagers destroyed their houses, cut down trees and set everything on fire in the hope of scaring the cat away, or at least depriving it of food. However, the cat did not leave, and so desperate for a solution, the elder sent a boy to fetch the oil seller. When the oil seller returned and learned what had happened, he offered to take the cat back, but only if the villagers paid him 2,000 piastres. In the end, the oil seller left the village with the cat, and 4,000 piastres in hand, while the villagers realised that living with mice wasn't so bad after all. Now this seems a very odd tale about an animal that is so useful, but our story doesn't stop here as cats continued to travel around the world and ended in Asia. We see the first evidence of domestic cats in China around 4,000 years ago, although the exact date of their appearance in Asia is difficult to determine, again, because there is a lack of early records in Chinese culture. They only date back to about 1500, 1600 BCE uh, and the Shang dynasty. And whilst their appearance in mythology and religion is negligible, uh, within Chinese folklore, cats are associated with good luck and prosperity and were kept because of their ability to catch vermin. But we do have a shared legend in Chinese and Japanese folklore about the beckoning cat named Maniki Niko, a cat with a raised paw that is believed to bring good luck. Now, these cats are often placed near entrances to homes or shops to try and persuade luck to enter the property. And one story of the legend goes like this. As a tired traveller made his way through the district of Edo in Tokyo, he was startled when a cat sitting outside a temple motioned for him to follow. Intrigued, the man followed the cat into the temple and began to explore. When suddenly, a massive storm rolled in, complete with thunder and lightning and heavy rain, 
and the traveller was grateful to have taken shelter in the temple, and so thankful that the cat had beckoned him in that he decided to purchase the temple as his own, his family temple. And this temple would later become known as Gotokuji Temple. Now, we see this legend adapt and grow with the cats having different colours, meaning different things and different paws raised to bring different kinds of luck. And that is why you may see cats in entrances of Chinese or Japanese restaurants, hoping to bring their owners luck. It is thought that domestic cats arrived in Greece around 3000 years ago and probably via Egyptian traders. And whilst the Greeks didn't venerate cats like the Egyptians, they soon found a place in Greek mythology with cats becoming associated with Artemis, the goddess of the hunt and the moon, as well as the fertility and childbirth. And they were also associated with being a protector of young girls and were invoked by mothers in childbirth to protect their daughters. And this protection included protecting the purity of the girls. And we see this evidence through the Homeric hymns of the 7th century BCE. Artemis' association with cats probably derived from their shared characteristics, such as being agile hunters, showing activity at night when the moon was out. And we see in myths, such as the sacred cat of Euphersis, that Artemis was the protector of the city of Euphersis. And this city had a temple dedicated to her, where a number of sacred cats were kept. And they were believed to be servants and symbols of Artemis. And so it was considered to be an honour to be chosen to look after those cats. And if anyone was found to harm them, then they would be punished. And so if we step back, we can see a significant amount of Egyptian influence in Greek mythology. And this happened very quickly, as it sorts the caps on Egyptian boats were introduced into Greece at the latest around 1000 BCE. And so it may have only taken a few hundred years for them to be introduced and firmly established as part of the mythology of Artemis. And from here, cats slowly became introduced all across Europe. The domestic cat probably didn't arrive in Scandinavia until around 2000 years ago, and so did not have much time to play a significant role in Nordic or Germanic mythology, especially when compared to other animals such as horses or bears or wolves. But we do see two significant occurrences, and they are within the myth of Utgard Loki, and where they are seen with Freya and her chariot. But neither of these are what they seem to be at first glance. The myth of Utgard Loki has Thor challenged to a number of tasks, and one is to lift a cat off the ground, and he fails. And we find out that the cat was actually the Jumangander, the, the world serpent. Now, what is interesting about this is that there is now much academic consensus that this myth was actually created by the Christian author of the prose, Snorri Sturluson, and used as a conversion tool to show the Nordic gods as being fallible. And so this could be considered folklore and only 800 years old or so. The other occurrence of cats associated with Freya uh, and her chariot, which is often seen as two grey cats pulling the chariot, but that can be disputed where the cat should be put in place. With the Gilfaganin of the Prose Edda, the cats are said to be drawn, well, or draw the chariot, which doesn't mean they pull it, but could have actually been alongside the chariot, directing it with Freya signifying their form of grace or beauty. Uh, plus there's also additional thought that her chariot could have actually been pulled by bears. But Freya was herself associated with cats, and certainly at the end of the 10th century, uh, so, so you would see Nordic farmers at this time leaving milk in their fields as an offering for the cats in the hope that they would protect their crops. And so, we see this common continuation of a theme where cats are used as a protection of domiciles and the storage of grain from pests. But from here, with the disappearance of many religions in favour of Christianity, we start seeing cats entering folklore as opposed to mythology. And there is a difference which you can learn about by watching this video. And so let me tell you about some of the more famous and interesting Folk tales on cats. The mice were upset that the cat kept catching them. That stealthy hunter. And so they decided to buy a bell to place on the cat's collar. But once they had the bell, 
no one was brave enough to try and put it on the cat. And so the mice gave up and sold it to a goblin. The goblin then thought it would make a pleasant flower, and so he turned it into the cat's bell flower. And that is how the cat's bell flowers came to be. But there's also a version of this story where the mice managed to put a bell on the cat's neck and its tail whilst the cat was asleep. But then the cat woke up as he was doing it and killed the main many mice and the rest of the mice ran away. But perhaps the most well-known story is Puss in Boots, which originated in France, which tells of how a clever and resourceful cat helps his master win the hand of a princess. But within folklore, we often see cats associated with magic as opposed to fantasy. And we have the cat of Scotland, which is said to be able to shape shift into human form and is believed to be the guardian of the dead. And not to be outdone, there are many stories in mainland Europe of a war cat, an evil being that hunts down humans. And then we have probably the most well-known black cats of all, the witch's cat, often depicted around Halloween folklore. And we often see witches who can transform themselves into these cats, rather than the previous folklore of cats that turn into humans. But this transformation of a cat into human is not lost, as we also see a motif where a cat acts as a familiar, which is a demonic spirit that witches can call up when they need help. And so sometimes the cat was also seen as a reincarnated form of previous familiars. What I've shown is that cats are rare in mythology as they are latecomers to human culture. But when they arrived, they became very important to society by protecting food and preventing diseases associated with vermin, and this aided the success of human populations as farming grew. And so, as cats became more accepted into communities and towns, and in cities, as civilizations grew, we can see the cat's importance recognised first in Egypt, who first fully domesticated the cat and introduced it into their mythology, including the myths such as cats having nine lives, as well as seeing the cat as a protector of homes and women and associating it with fertility due to the number and size of litters a cat would have. And some of these Egyptian motifs then migrate along with the cat using trade routes, first to India and then to China and eventually to Europe via Greece and then to the rest of the world. And we have evidence for this, not just through archaeology, but the amount of myth associated with the cat, which reduced the closer we get to present day. And it's because of this late arrival, especially when considered to other animals, that we just don't see much ritualistic behaviour around the cat when compared to these other animals, such as the dog and the horse. And instead, the cat is left in history and so in folklore. But where there is mythology, then the cat is seen as very much as a feminine figure, most often represented by goddesses and protecting the home and the attributes of fertility and childbirth, probably driven by the size of those cat litters. But it is in folklore where the cat develops magical powers and superstition grew. And much of the reason can still be perceived today as a cat today really isn't much different to the cat of 10,000 years ago. It is still very independent, it is still a stealthy hunter, and if in the home it catches pests and often goes out at night, and if you ever shine a light into the eyes of the cat at night, it looks somewhat possessed. But here we've only really just scraped the surface of the folklore, as I wanted to concentrate more on the mythological side and growth of the cat. But if you want to hear more about the folklore, then please do let me know in the comments below when you click in that like button. I do read all the comments and we'll take them on board and if there's enough support we can do this. And I also want to thank my patrons who support this channel and suggested this topic to talk about. And for those who have stayed until the very end, then I want to say a special thank you as I hit 100,000 subscribers and that is all down to you watching and supporting this channel. Your likes, your comments, your questions, it's just made this channel develop and grow. And I hope I can continue to make videos that keep you watching for many more years in the future and drink much more tea. And so thank you for that milestone in Crack of Vault history. And if you prefer dogs to cats, then I can suggest you watch this video. And until the next time, 
please stay safe and well. And this was Crackenford. <laughs>